There are not a lot of men around anymore that can honestly say that they did things their way. I don't mean that by necessarily being defiant or rebellious, but in the context of doing what is right, doing the right thing, which oftentimes comes at the expense of personal advancement, financial gain, or public approval and popularity. One such example of someone who stepped forward in an attempt to bring to light what may not be in the best interests of humanity at great risk to himself was Phil Schneider. He was a geologist that claimed to have worked in several government black ops projects, digging massive underground bases and tunnel systems, which he claimed was being used towards the eventual enslavement of the planet. Schneider went to engineering school and studied geological engineering and structural engineering that included aerospace and military applications. He trained in explosives and the effect of explosives on structures. He claimed that his first job with the Morrison Knudsen Corporation, who specialized with construction of deep underground mountain or military bases, also called dumbs. He claimed there were well over a hundred of these subterranean facilities in the United States and that they're all connected by high-speed tram or by regular underground highways. One of the more fascinating aspects to his story is that he discloses that his father was brought over to America from Germany during World War II and given a new identity to work in classified projects. While I must admit that parts of his story are hard to swallow, many elements of his biography, particularly in regards to being the son of an Operation Paperclip German scientist, are entirely plausible, and the manner in which he died was very suspicious and possibly involved foul play. Yeah, I'm Phil Schneider. I worked 17 years for the United States government as a geologist and uh, aerospace engineer as well as a structural engineer. I worked for uh, such elusive uh, and elusive occupations uh, uh, with uh, Morrison Knudsen, Bechtel, Page and Page, uh, Aerospecial of France, uh, uh, and a host of other uh, E.G. and G. and a host of other Los Alamos laboratory and these kind of things. Anyway, my work as a geologist in building underground uh, military bases, some of which are over two miles underground, high-speed monorail uh, uh, subway cars, if you might want to call them, that link these bases together. Some of them are capable of uh, uh, riding on a cushion of air about three quarters of an inch off a rail at, at uh, better part of Mach 2. Incidentally, I helped work on 13 deep underground military bases. Actual had hands-on experience. Uh, uh, Notorious was the one in, uh, in and around the Dulce, the southern, uh, southeastern and southwestern sides of Dulce, New Mexico, in the Los Alamos uh, laboratory regions where we built some hermetically sealed rooms that were very deep. Uh, going down over a mile. Um, we also built uh, an additions onto uh, uh, Groom Lake and S2 and S4 complexes. Uh, there are a total of nine underground. Are called, they're called DUMBs, like you can learn a lot from this dummy, but uh, D-U-M-B stands for Deep Underground Military Base. And uh, or a deep underground, a DUMB 2, for instance, is a submarine base, and I helped build a few of those too which are uh, uh, off our continental shelves and then certain islands and uh, out in the Atlantic and the Pacific in strategic locations. My father was a, a U-boat captain in, in Hitler's Navy and uh, he got captured and uh, taken over. Uh, I didn't find this out until about two weeks before he died on his deathbed. He kind of told everybody in total shock um, I was one of them. Uh, for I, in fact, I didn't believe him. I thought he was kind of del in delirium or something like that. And of course, other things have come up since. And so, um, anyway, he was uh, captured by the French, turned over to the Third Army, the U.S. Third Army, and then U.S. Third Army turned him over to the Navy. 
and he was a master machinist. Now, that's not a journeyman. A master means that he's a, they can take a block of metal and make a gun or a watch or some other fine instrument. And uh, uh, he was a master machinist. He later became an MD doctor and uh, part of the aerospace medicine group of the United States Navy. Was instrumental in helping build the USS Nautilus and its uh, first uh, nuclear-powered uh, 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 predecessor, the uh, uh, Enterprise, the first nuclear-powered uh, aircraft carrier and other, other ships like it. He pioneered all the ways in, uh, in building uh, uh, very small and miniature nuclear in, uh, engines, and uh, um, he even helped build, uh, helped work later on in his life, he helped uh, develop the infamous uh, grid bed nuclear motor, which is now employed in some things that look like flying saucers that people claim are flying saucers. Yes, we are, we, in quote, the United States Air Force and other armed forces, are training other European forces to fly unidentified or now identified or in quote flying saucers. We've actually built built several prototypes that are flying under uh, the uh, under uh, uh, names of uh, uh, black craft. My position as a geologist and engineer got me to see a lot of things in the world. I've been in over 70 countries. I also worked for NATO. I carried a level three security clearance with a rhyolite factor. Rhyolite is a hardened factor. Only given out to a handful of civilians and maybe a couple of hundred military men worldwide. Um, I thought I was doing uh, the nation United States, as well as the world of favor, by uh, I thought I was uh, uh, kind of keeping my end up. Uh, well, it didn't work out that way. By the way, I'm still a geologist, still do geological survey work. However, I don't work for the government anymore. I uh, took my uh, security clearance and all my government uh, stuff and uh, cut it up and sent it back to the, pardon my French, uh, SOBs. Uh, when I found out that a number of these 131 deep underground military bases are being used to subvert the Constitution of these United States and its people, I says, that is enough. Yes, this gentleman over here. Speak up, please. Okay. Uh, yes, they are. Uh, the gentleman asked, are these tunnels connected to large caverns? Yes, these large bases are basically like this, uh, like this uh, uh, Colosseum. Everything's underground. Everything's a city underground. Uh, most, most of these uh, bases have, uh, are, both have military bases, and they have uh, all the accoutrements of life. Remember, each one of these costs quite a bundle of dough, and and uh, some of it in our tax money, but most of it in clandestine uh, uh, approaches, and that's uh, definitely undermining the country. Uh, the New World Order right now uh, basically is uh, dismantling countries, uh, uh, governments, uh, telling governments not to war with each other anymore, basically, so that uh, looks good on the outside. Uh, of course, you've often heard of the term Global 2000, and that's a supposed sinister plot, or has been a group of sinister plots to produce uh, uh, biological weaponry to uh, uh, reduce or thin out the so-called ethnic cleanse of the population of the planet. It might be where these new designer diseases like AIDS and Ebola and Huntavirus and all these kinds of things have come up out of nowhere and these diseases, in quote, uh, almost have a mind of their own. Phil Schneider died under mysterious circumstances shortly after this lecture was filmed in 1995. Officially, it was documented as a suicide, but his wife contests that and claims he would never do that, warned against it happening, and that he was allegedly strangled. 
even if there was foul play in his death, it does not necessarily validate his claims, many of which are considered by many to be far-fetched. What does lend credibility to Phil's testimony are the numerous other testimonials by other people that have come forward with similar accounts of secret projects in underground facilities in the U.S., in Germany, and in the polar regions. William Tompkins claims to have had access to top-secret spy information acquired through his naval career during World War II. Tompkins says that his work was partly controlled by the naval personnel who used to work for James Forrestal, the first Secretary of Defense who was allegedly assassinated because he was going to go public to reveal what he knew about UFOs and Antarctica where a South Polar colony was said to have been established by a contingent of Germans that did not surrender with the rest of Germany in 1945. This renegade breakaway civilization was likely the true mission of Operation High Jump in 1946, to locate and terminate this final Nazi holdout, which was unsuccessful for the Allies. In an interview given to Gaia TV at the age of 94, here's a brief excerpt from Bill Tompkins giving his testimonial shortly before also passing away. It's 42, 1942. The war's on. Riccobata, his hobby is sending these Navy operatives into Germany. They've been going all over Germany, and they're staggered at what they found. Hundreds of different types of advanced weapons being built. These included 60 foot and 250 foot, 500 foot UFOs, round vehicles, okay, UFOs. Um, they built some of these out of chromoly steel that would weigh tons and tons and tons. They had developed, or they had been given, electromagnetic anti-gravitational propulsion. They have all these UFOs, different types of propulsion that were unbelievable, uh, laser weapon systems, uh, unbelievable stuff. All over the country, Germany and the occupied areas, they had massive underground production facilities that they were using, uh, they had developed for regular uh, arms waste like tanks and places to build uh, Navy ships and all this kind of stuff. Most of it was underground. So they started expanding those facilities and they put 11 of these UFO shape vehicles in production. So the operatives are trying to explain to us and the Admiral would back off and say, slow down, I don't believe you. And that went on, and then the captains would say the same thing. The operatives were nice guys, and they knew they were going to get the questions when they got back into the admiral's office, and they knew that nobody was going to believe what they said. And we were the ones, the only people that this information was given to uh, by the operatives. Forrestal was the number one person in the country who ran the proper organization, the real organization to handle technically the extraterrestrial. So he was supposed to have had a mental breakdown, so they took him to the hospital there in Washington, at the top floor, and uh, pushed him out the window. And so that's the guy that wrote Admiral Rickabata's mission, which then my mission came from his. That was the level of this information uh, in the United States. So we had a young girl, Nordic, just outside of Germany. Some people talked to her, and they said, uh, you are now involved in a new program, and you're going to have great support in this program. She had developed with, an, I think she had eight girls. They were continually talked to, telepathically, to go and design spaceships. The little blonde actually 
built them. And eventually, two of those got over here uh, in Area 51. But Germany found out about the blonde, took her over, stopped everything, and then got to this point where there was some sort of pressurized program by the SS to control that original group. Now, several times they did work together, but Hitler allowed them to operate independently of the whole SS program, the whole development. So we had two developments going on in Germany. The girls didn't want their vehicles to be used for anything else but travel. They were afraid that somebody would get a hold of it and they use it for military, which is, of course, what they got. But the girls finally ended up in Antarctica in the large facilities, in fact, three massive caverns. And so uh, there's cities manufacturing uh, everything that you would need on a planet. Four years before the war was over, it was decided that the war could possibly be lost, but uh, if we win it, we still need to get out of the area because the Allies are going to bomb us off of the Earth and there won't be anything here left for us. So they decided to move to everything to Antarctica. Admiral Byrd, they're going to go down there and they were going to take out the whole thing in one week. The top people in every area of the Navy, best aircraft, best ships, best weapons, everything. And uh, five weeks later, things didn't look very good. When we got down there, they had decided they were going to have one thrust from the west side of an article and then the opposite side coming into both of them towards the center of the uh, continent. And so before we even got all the guys around, and they, I'm talking about big four-engine flying boats, okay, and ships, uh, battleships and destroyers and submarines and you name it. Uh, before they got there, these fairly large, they were 100 foot diameter saucers, came up out of the ocean and took down everything. Many of the close-ups give you a real clear, clear picture of the cross on them. Uh, but we lost that war. All over Germany and the occupied countries, Germany was building mass production of a dozen different types of extraterrestrial vehicles, okay? So these are in mass production, not just prototype kind of thing. They've gone into mass production using slave labor with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, an, of in mountain massive facilities. Eighty percent of that had all been removed from Germany uh, six months before the war ended. It had all been taken to Antarctica and they were continuing the construction down there. They had access to these uh, with their submarines. Uh, they built massive truck submarines, not enormous submarines, to bring all this stuff down to Antarctica. So the submarine still submerged, goes through these tunnels. They go back through with the tunnels and they get to a lake where there's all these facilities in the cities and naval, I mean, naval bases and towns and uh, thousands of people. While Tompkins' testimony also contains some elements that may seem far-fetched, the general narrative is plausible that Operation High Jump is still classified because it is possibly hiding some untold realities about World War II, how it ended, and the technologies that were developed during that time. At 94 years old and one year before his passing, it's unlikely that Tompkins was making up stories for fame and fortune, and his military credibility adds to the growing body of evidence that points to the possibility that free energy 
electromagnetic propulsion and gravitics exist and have been successfully developed and that there are groups of Nordic looking people that may have used this advanced technology to break away from the grip of the current political force that controls the planet. Another researcher that spoke out along these lines was Bulgarian born Vladimir Terzinski. He would lecture about advanced technology and secret societies until he suddenly vanished around the year 2000. Here's a brief clip of him adding his take on the subterranean South Polar Colony allegedly built by the Germans. The Germans were very deep into the occult, into the black magic, into all these things that the media would prefer not to talk about. <coughs> a lot of this supposedly came up during the Nuremberg trials and it all was stricken out of the record. Uh, the Germans were fascinated with uh, the South Pole and Hans Hubriger was uh, an author and a philosopher that Hitler and all the other SS men and Nazi men were crazy about. Kubriger had this philosophy of the fire and ice that the German character, which is the New World Order, the Illuminati philosophy of creating the supermensch of the future, that only the fire and ice of the harsh polar conditions can toughen the steel character of the supermensch of the future. And this is the second reason that they went after the South Pole. A third and bigger reason lies deep into the German mythology about the Thule people. When Greenland was uh, still not under ice, there was a tall, blonde, Nordic-looking race that lived there and later moved to the inner of the earth and still lives there, flying their saucers, much more advanced than their uh, lagging, uh, should I call them, Helga, should I call them, retarded brothers on the surface of the planet and so it has been the secret dream of the Germans on the surface to find and to reunite with their more advanced uh, Aryan brothers uh, from the inner earth according to German and secret SS mythology and the more obvious reason was that they were losing the war in Germany and uh, ever since the United States entered the war it became obvious to anybody who had some international cosmopolitan education in Germany that they would lose the war. To every German plane produced and flown in the air there were five Allied planes. We have seldom been told these statistics that the Germans had less than, I mean about one five of the planes, uh, probably the ratios of artillery, of tanks and of other armaments were not much different. I mean they, they were bound to lose that war, they didn't have the industrial capacity to match the Americans, the British and the Russians. I mean, in the end of the war, uh, British and Russians could freely bomb Germany with almost impunity. They couldn't reach anything of the, uh, 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 of the Russian mega continent, very little of England, and nothing of the United States. I mean, they were bound to lose that war. So, they basically decided to lose the European war in order to win the South Polar War. This is the same, uh, I think, yeah. So in the <coughs> late 30s, in 1936, the SS party did a, did a, excellent, a four-year plan for the colonization of the South Pole. The Firiaris plan very detailed plan. They were showing the areas without any snow. It's okay. Without any snow. Uh, and we see the seal of the first German Antarctic expedition. 1938-39. We see here quietly the uh, oak leaves of the... This is oak, right? Yeah, yeah. The oak leaves of the Thule Society, it was under the sponsorship of the, the secret uh, patronage of the Thule Society. They descended on the South Pole. This is a letter of 
congratulations, signed by uh, Göring, the Reich Marshal of Aviation, uh, to the members of the South Pole Expedition. And one may think, uh, how come that the Aviation Reich's Minister is interested in the South Polar Expedition? Unless they were preparing to build some bases there for the Luftwaffe. Uh, the motor ship, uh, the research ship Schwabenland was launching flying boats that were uh, scouting the South Polar continent and staking their claims. They didn't even bother to land at all places. They would just drop flags with heavy poles. That was enough by international convention. And then they would register their claims with the International Court of Hague. And this is how in 38-39 the Germans became the legal owners of a chunk of real estate probably as big as uh, two-thirds of Europe, south of South Africa on the South Pole. Here are members of the expedition staking the claim. Much later, photographs appeared in the late 40s of the German colony in the Neuschwabenland from an altitude way above and beyond the altitude of the biggest stratospheric bombers of the time, which was about 10, 12 kilometers. This is an altitude of 60, 70 kilometers, maybe 100 kilometers, basically Earth's orbit. And the speculation is that this is a photograph of the German South Polar colony from a saucer, from that height. That coastal region? Excuse that coastal me? Coastal region? Yeah. Close to the coastal region. Uh, how could the Germans do that? How could they move so much stuff to the South Pole? Simple logistics. I mean, I have this question again. How can you do that if you are the Kriegsmarine chief of operations? It was so hard for Admiral Byrd to go there in the 20s and 30s. Until a friend of mine told me, who is a U-boat buff, Henry Stevens from the German Research Project, one of the persons that, have, that has helped me tremendously in my research, he discovered that uh, there were German transport submarines that could hold 5,000 tons, that were 5,000 uh, 5, deadweight tons, which is about two and a half times as much as the standard uh, Allied Liberty class transport ships. The Germans had two and a half times bigger submarines than the Allies were building surface ships. These submarines were so huge they could carry bulk cargo, they could carry personnel, they could carry armaments, anything. They were building them in sections on assembly lines in several dry docks at incredible speed. After the war ended, it became clear that about 100 of these submarines mysteriously disappeared. They were never scuttled, bombed, torpedoed, or, 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 or uh, surrendered by their crews. They just disappeared into thin air, a whole fleet of 100 submarines. Some of them resurfaced with skeleton crews of about a dozen men in Argentina after they departed from Kiel and with uh, fully loaded with hundreds of people on board. And little by little the story emerged that the Germans had been cooking uh, something big on the South Pole. I'm sorry. So Admiral Byrd went to the South Pole chasing something. Uh, some almost avoids rumors about Hitler being alive. Combined with our study of the German U-boat research and development, and Admiral Byrd's uh, expeditions, chasing somebody there in 46, 47, clearly show that a lot more is going on the South Pole than the media, the illuminated media here is willing to admit, the party line media. What exactly is going on on the South Pole? Admiral Byrd went to the South Pole in the 20s, 28, 27, 28, then in the 30s, 36, 7, to Little America. Little America is south of 
Well, right on the... The German presence is in Neuschwabenland, which is south of South Africa. Little America is on the opposite side of Neuschwabenland, so it becomes south of uh, the Pacific somewhere, south of Australia. It was 1939, second expedition. Yeah, yeah. I found some second-hand, uh, uh, some used bookstore volumes on that expedition for 80 bucks, and I'm probably going to get them because they have some very interesting photographs there. In 46-47, which is the second South Polar summer, the first summer after the war was the winter, our winter of 45-46, which was too close. They did not have enough time to prepare just three months after the war ended in Japan in uh, September 45. It was too fast for them. They probably had not investigated yet. They, they, the intelligence services have not realized the full amount of the German presence there. So, a year and several months later, in the next South Polar summer, which is the winter for us of 46, 47, Admiral Byrd put together an armada of 4,000 men, armed ships, submarines, armed coast, uh, coast guard, uh, icebreakers, uh, armed supply ships. <laughs> there were Russian and British contingents in that uh, flotilla. Obviously, it was an Allied attempt. It was labeled a peaceful expedition for exploration of the South Pole, and we would see the shortened version of the film later on. However, in this peaceful expedition, we see uh, the uh, advancing American forces peacefully uh, storming uh, the white fields of, 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 of the South Pole. Yeah, with their amphibious vehicles. And other track units. Uh, These are personnel carriers and other amphibious vehicles. It was a massive army operation, army and only army. Very few scientists were involved. Admiral Byrd lost in about two weeks most of his planes and retreated in disgrace and made an unauthorized interview which probably cost him his career in Argentina on his way back quite probably, refueling or reloading with supplies in an Argentinian port. He had the lack of political insight to make this politically <laughs> incorrect interview, saying that I think the next world war will, will, be with an, will be with an adversary that comes from the polar regions and that has the ability to fly unobstructed from pole to pole. Clearly talking about the German South Polar presence and uh, their ability to outfly anything the Americans could confront them with. Uh, some of the planes were shot directly by the saucers. Others were hit by beam weapons. They didn't know what hit them. Third, uh, collided with invisible barriers and disintegrated in mid-flight by reports of other planes nearby, which was obvious that the Germans had already installed the force field shields around their colony. This whole operation was meant to show to that faction of the American military that, well, see guys, we can't do anything because they are a lot, they are a lot more powerful than us. Our talks at length about stories that actually the two bombs dropped over Hiroshima and Nagasaki were German-made that were captured in the underground caves by the Americans. And Hitler decided not to use these bombs, probably by the same reason that he decided not to kill all the British that were left at Dun stranded at Dunkirk at the beginning of the war. He didn't really want war with England anyway. Hitler didn't want war with England to begin with. Uh, not only that, but uh, when his generals proposed to smash all the Brits there, he said, no, 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 gentlemen, you're missing the big point. We are not fighting, we are not in war with Aryans. We are not, uh, what, we are not in the business of killing Aryans. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. As always, I look forward to reading your comments. 
So please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.